So we've talked a lot about genes and how they're inherited, but the big question that you should have at this point is how are the genes controlled? And so that's what we're going to look at now, at the control of what we call gene expression. Um, I mentioned earlier that the phenotype often is called the appearance, the physical appearance, but it's not always an appearance. It's, it's just the, the uh, expression of the gene. It could be an enzyme or a hormone that's not visible in the body. We have um, various processes involved in regulating genes. So gene regulation itself is the turning on and off of genes, and the process of the information flow from the gene to protein is called gene expression. This allows cells to produce the kinds of proteins that are needed in certain places in certain times. We first learned about gene control or the under, began to understand gene control by studying a bacterium that is E. coli. E. coli is a rod-shaped bacterium that lives in your intestines and it's uh, beneficial um, in your body where it's supposed to be because it helps you synthesize certain vitamins and so forth but it also it, but it feeds off of what you eat because it does live in your digestive system. Well you eat different things all the time you don't eat the same things all the time so the the E. coli has to be able to turn genes on and off to make the enzymes it needs to, for the different things you eat. When you have a cluster of genes that have related functions uh, along with a sequence that controls the gene. This is called an operon. Operons are present in prokaryotes. There are similar processes in eukaryotes. We'll talk about after we talk about operons, but operons are relatively easy for us to understand how they work. Okay, so let's, one thing that, that uh, you don't always eat is milk. Um, you eat milk sometimes and sometimes, or drink milk sometimes and sometimes you don't. Lactose is a sugar that is found in milk. There's no reason for the E. coli bacteria to make the enzymes to break down lactose unless lactose is present. Okay, so but when the E. coli encounters lactose, then it has all the enzymes present in the in the bacterial genome, and they're made all at one time using this operon that that makes lactose. So the lactose operon we call it the lac operon includes the genes. There there are three genes that are involved in utilizing lactose. There's a promoter sequence where the RNA polymerase binds to start the transcription of those genes. And there's an operator sequence where a repressor can bind to block the RNA polymerase to keep it turned off when it's not needed. Bacteria don't have a lot of energy. Remember, they depend almost entirely on um, glycolysis for their energy so they don't have a lot of energy and it's important that they not waste energy making things they don't need when they don't need them. So the regulatory gene outside the operon is what codes for this repressor protein. When at lactose is not present the repressor binds to the operator and blocks the RNA polymerase from transcribing the gene. Lactose when it is present inactivates the repressor, that therefore unblocking the operator and allowing the RNA polymerase to attach and transcribe the genes in the LAC operon. So let's see what it looks like, okay? So here's our sequence of DNA, all right? And this area here in the light blue is called the operon. The regulatory gene is somewhere upstream and it codes the, the repressor. This is what the repressor looks like. And it attaches to the operator here, preventing RNA polymerase from attaching and transcribing the genes. So it turns off the operon. When lactose is present, it binds to the repressor and inactivates the repressor, making it fall off. Then RNA polymerase can be bound to the promoter and can transcribe uh, the, the, uh, the gene and those, the gene can be then translated into the enzymes that are needed to use lactose. Very handy process. Once the lactose is gone, the repressor reattaches to the operator and it stops the, it stops the translation process from occurring until it's needed again. There are two types of repressor controlled operons. The lac operon is the one we just talked about. In this one, the repressor is active when it is alone, but inactivated when it is bound to the, to the molecule, lactose. 
Another operon in bacteria is called the trip operon. The trip operon is the operon that is involved in utilizing or in producing tryptophan, an essential amino acid. And most of the time it is needed in the bacterium. So in this case the repressor is inactive when it's not bound to tryptophan, but when it does bind to tryptophan then it attaches to the operator and blocks the transcription. Think about what happens when you eat a big turkey dinner. Turkey has lots of tryptophan in it, so your, the E. coli in your, in your gut don't need to make tryptophan when they've got a lot of it present, so why not turn off the operon while you have that source of tryptophan readily present in order to make the proteins that you need. This shows you kind of how it works with the active and inactive repressors. Okay, here's the lac operon. The active repressor attaches to the operator and um, it is active in the absence of lactose, but when lactose is present, it inactivates it. In the trip operon, it is, uh, the operon is active when tryptophan is present, but when atriptophan is absent, then it's inactive, allowing the making or the, the um, transcription, the synthesis of tryptophan. Another type of operon involves uh, activators, which are proteins that turn on the operators. These bind to the DNA and make it easier for the RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter, and they control a lot of different kinds of operons. One thing that's really important ab about gene um, control or gene express the control of gene expression is differentiation when you get to when you're talking about multicellular organisms like humans okay all of your cells have the same DNA but they don't all look alike and don't all do the same kind of thing and so differentiation during the development of the embryo is really important and it's controlled by turning on and off specific genes at specific times. The differences in the types of cells in your body are not due to the presence of different genes, but due to selective expression of the genes that are present there. Uh, eukaryotic uh, chromosomes have a lot of different levels of folding and coiling. This is called DNA packing. Uh, you can imagine if you have about a meter of DNA in each one of your six trillion cells that there's a lot of packing that has to go on to, to make that DNA molecule small enough to fit into, your, into the nuclei of your cells. What this packaging does, uh, it forms these, the wraps around these proteins called, and forming these uh, nucleosomes, and it looks like beads on a string. Each one of those nucleosome beads contains DNA and some histone molecules, histones a protein, and then there are stretches of DNA that join those, and then the beaded string gets wrapped up into a tight fiber, and then the fiber coils into a thick supercoil. This can compact the DNA a great deal, by looping. As you can imagine, it would be difficult to uh, open up part of that chromosome to be um, to be expressed or be translated in, or transcribed into messenger RNA when it's so tightly packed. And so the DNA packing at different locations can definitely affect the gene expression. There are also, some genes that are inactivated for a long term, maybe they're needed in early in development and not needed again later on. And so it appears that the DNA is more tightly packed in those areas to inactivate those genes. When you look at interphase chromosomes, you can see the very highly compacted cro chromosome in some areas of the chromosome and less compacted in others. And so it makes sense that the tightly compact, highly compacted part would not be expressed. Here we have a picture that kind of shows you what happens. Here's our doubled helix, and you can see it's, it's twisted tightly and wrapped around the histone proteins, forming that beads on a string appearance that you see here in the, in the micrograph. And then they're, they're wound up tightly into those nucleosomes, or wound up into the helical fiber, which then winds up into a supercoil, which, which compacts even more tightly into the chromosome. So there are lots of different levels of the, of the DNA packing that occur there. There also can be chemical modifications of DNA um, by, or the histones by something called epigenetic inher inheritance. There are certain enzymes that can add a methyl group to the DNA bases. It doesn't change the sequence of bases, but it does inactivate 
that area of the DNA. Once the genes are methylated, they generally stay that way through all the cell divisions in the individual and can be passed on to offspring. Removing those methyl groups can turn on some of the genes again. But here's what's interesting is that the, the, the traits that can be transmitted by these mechanisms that don't involve the nucleotide sequence uh, can be passed on to offspring. And we don't really understand all of the processes involved in this, but it does occur. And we'll watch a video in class about epigenetics. Another thing that occurs in mammals, especially, is something called, in female mammals, is something called X chromosome inactivation. Of course, we already mentioned that males only need one X chromosome, whereas females have two, but apparently only one is needed to take care of the needs of the cell. And so in female mammals, one of the two X chromosomes is is uh, packed up tightly. It's called it's called um, a bar body. It's it's inactivated by highly compacting, and it becomes inactive in terms of being transcribed. And it doesn't that it's not any specific one. It's just randomly either the maternal or the paternal chromosome that gets inactivated. This occurs pretty early in the in development of the embryo. The descendants of those original cells that inactivate the X chromosome all have the same chromosome inactivated, which means that there may be patches of cells that have one chromosome or the other one turned off. And that can affect uh, things that are showing, that show up in the phenotype of the offspring. An example of this is tortoiseshell coloration in cats. Cats, in cats, the color genes are located on the X chromosomes. And so in this case, you had um, an allele for black fur color from one parent and the allele for orange fur color from the other parent. And depending on which of those two chromosomes becomes inactivated early in the embryonic development, that will determine what color fur is exhibited on the surface of the adult cat. And here you can see in the picture patches of orange fur and patches of black fur, depending on which uh, X chromosome gets inactivated. This is why tortoiseshell and calico cats are usually only female cats because they have two chromosomes, two X chromosomes, one of which can be inactivated uh, in different parts of the body. Males only have the one X chromosome, so they're not going to have that patchiness that, that occurs in the tortoiseshell and the, and the calico cat. There are other proteins that can affect eukaryotic transcription. There are activators and repressors that are present in the DNA that can bind to specific segments of DNA and either make it easier for the DNA to be transcribed or more difficult for the DNA to be transcribed. The activator proteins seem to be more important than repressors and so apparently it, it seems to be that the default state for most genes is off. And so then you have to turn on the genes that you need to transcribe the, the DNA that needs to be transcribed in that particular instance. Um, RNA polymerase in eukaryotes requires other proteins called transcription factors to uh, initiate the transcription process. And there are various kinds of, of uh, proteins that are involved in this, or activator protein, proteins and, and other ones that can combine together and bind uh, as a complex of proteins at the promoter. That will then allow the RNA polymerase to attach to the promoter and begin the transcription process. This shows you all the, uh, a diagram showing you all of the different factors that must uh, join together to make that complex including the bending of the DNA and, and the enhancer regions there to start the transcription process of occurring. There are also silencers. These are pre repressor proteins that can inhibit transcription. And so you have a, a lot of different factors involved in the uh, coordinating the gene expression in eukaryotes. And there are of, often um, a number of different control elements that are involved in gene metabolic pathways of various kinds in the body. 
Also, the RNA, remember, can be, has to be spliced in eukaryotes, and it can be spliced differently, producing different RNAs from the same transcribed portion. And that can result in the, pro, in the production of more than one gene, protein from the same gene. And this is probably pretty common in humans. Here we have an example of what could happen there depending on which uh, exons are spliced together and which entwines are removed, you can end up with different RNA product, messenger RNA products from the same transcribed portion of DNA.